Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for chapter 12 on Entropy. So the first thing I want to do is a little demo to describe for you how we're going to treat a solid in, uh, in terms of the thermal energy associated with the vibrational motion of the atoms in the solid. So let's take a look at that. So here we have a, uh, a simulation of a crystal and it's basically a chunk of matter that uh, is made up of atoms connected side to side and you can see that uh, everybody's sort of wiggling around and the question is uh, how can we treat this as a collection of oscillators and uh, one way would be just to focus on one atom at a time let's think about how that might work okay so here we have a three-dimensional model of an atom stuck inside a cube where the spring is connected to the walls of the box. Now this is obviously not quite right because it's really embedded in a crystal that goes on uh, in all directions with uh, neighboring atoms next door and so on. But for the purposes of our uh, work today, we're going to use this as a, as a simple model of what's going on. Now the interesting thing is, because it's a quantum mechanical object, we know that we have to somehow work out the energy levels that are permitted for this thing to have. Now the interesting thing is, because the potential energy goes like 1 half kx squared plus 1 half ky squared plus 1 half kz squared, you can actually separate this out into x, y, and z uh, directions and solve the quantum mechanical problem uh, with each direction more or less acting independently. Now the details of how that works are sort of beyond the scope of what we're doing here. The bottom line is that a three-dimensional atom stuck in a crystal behaves a lot like three independent one-dimensional masses connected to a spring. And we know that right now these guys are all three in their ground state, but we can excite the thing in the x direction and now you see it's wiggling with a little bit more energy in the x direction. I could make it wiggle more and yet more and yet more and now you see it's in the one, two, three, the fourth excited state in the x direction but in the y and the z direction it's still in the ground state. Now because the spacing of the energy levels is the same in all three directions because presumably the spring constant is the same for all three directions I could keep the total energy the same by dropping the x direction down one and bumping the y direction up one. Or I could drop the x direction down two and bop the y direction up two. Or I could bop the y direction down one and bop the z direction. So in other words, any uh, superposition or any combination of a one, two, three, four. So here I have one in the z, one in the y, and two in the x. That has, that's the same total energy as I had before with four in the uh, x and zero in the y and the z. Anyway, you kind of get a sense of physically what's going on inside the crystal for different amounts of energy in the different directions of motion. All right, so that's the idea. Okay, so let's see. If we, uh, if we have an atom in a box, this of course represents one atom out of our crystal, and we let it wiggle around, what we want to figure out is um, how many ways are there to distribute the energy, in this case the example I want to do is four quanta of energy, among the three oscillators associated with the three different directions of motion. So you could, of course, put all four quanta into one direction. So you could have four in the x and none in the y and none in the z. Or you could have four in the y and none in the x and none in the z. Or you could have zero in the x and zero in the y and four in the z. So there's three ways, but that's not the only way. You could also distribute uh, two in the x, two in the y, and zero in the z, and so on. Um, so there's six different ways to store uh, two in one and two in the other, or two in one and one in the other, and one in the other, and stuff like that. And finally, there's, a, there's another six ways, and that is if we put three in the first one, and one in the second, and none in the third, and so on. So, altogether, let's see, we've got six and six, that's twelve, and then three more makes fifteen. 
So if you look at all those, there are 15 possible ways to distribute four quanta among three oscillators. So it, the variables we're going to be using in this class to describe those three quantities are omega, which is the number of waves, q, which is the number of quanta, and n, which is the number of oscillators. So each of these ways, these 15 ways, is called a microstate. In other words, it's a microscopical distribution that's different from the other microscopical distribution, but they all have the same property that their total amount of energy is four quanta. So the fact that there are four quanta is called a macrostate because, um, because if you just care about the total no energy, then you don't care about exactly how it's distributed, and, and so those all belong to the same macroscopic behavior. In statistical thermodynamics, we're going to assume that every microstate is equally probable. So that means that no microstate is any better or worse than any other microstate. And if you wait around long enough, they'll all be visited with equal likelihood. That's kind of the idea. In the end, when we're calculating the flow of energy from place to place, it turns out we don't really need to know the details of all the uh, distributions. We just need to know how many ways there are to distribute the energy with a particular total value. So let's march ahead and see what happens if we have two atoms that are sort of connected together somehow so they can they can exchange energy but the total energy in the two atoms is going to remain fixed so let's look at how that might work how many ways can one atom have four and the other atom have none well there's only one way an atom can have no energy and that's if all three are zero and so 15 has to be the answer to that question how many ways can one have one and the other have three? Well, you can have one unit in three different ways, either one in the x and zero everywhere else, or one in the y and zero everywhere else, or one in the z and zero everywhere else. And it turns out there's 10 different ways to distribute three quanta among three oscillators, which you can show yourself if you want to play with it. And so that means altogether there are 30 different ways of one having one and the other having three because you have to multiply the number of ways the first one can have one by the number of ways the second one can have three in order to calculate the total number of ways that they can have one and three. And uh, if you keep going like that, you'll end up with a result that looks something like this. <coughs> that the number of ways uh, the first atom can have no quanta and the second atom can have 4 is 15 and then it's 30 for the first one to have 1 and the second one to have 3 and it turns out to be 36 I think for the first one to have 2 and the second one to have 2 and of course if the s first one has 3 and the second one has 1 that's no different from the first one having 1 and the second one having 3 and so on so it's a symmetrical distribution in this case since each atom has the same number of oscillators and it turns out the most likely situation is that they each have two because that has the greatest number of microstates associated with um, the macrostate. So the next question is, uh, if I gave you uh, 50 oscillators and asked you how many ways there are to put 12 quanta on 50 oscillators, for example, that would be a very difficult calculation to work out um, by hand like this. So what we'd like is a formula that enables us to uh, get the answer without having to work it out by hand by counting one by one. So this is really a game of uh, combinatorics. So the idea goes something like this. Um, we're going to come up with a trick to help us count the number of ways of having four quanta and three oscillators uh, using a uh, sort of a graphical representation that will enable us to then generalize. So let, let's look at the picture. The, the 310, 301, 130 set. Um, I want you to imagine a situation where you have partitions that tell you uh, when you move from one atom to the next and dots that represent the amount of energy. <coughs> so for example, the first on the left there in the upper left is three quanta in the first oscillator, one 
quanta in the second oscillator and zero quanta in the third oscillator. So we could represent that with three dots and then a partition and then one dot for the one quanta in the middle and then a partition and then no dots. Notice that with three oscillators we have two partitions to separate the boundary between the uh, one on the left and the middle and the one in the middle and the right. So there's three minus one partitions and because there's four quanta we have four dots and quickly you can see how this goes for the other situations we got three zero one we've got one three zero we've got zero three one one zero three and zero one three so those are all the combinations that correspond to um, one three and zero and just as an example we could also do four zero 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 four zero and zero zero four and you can see you could also do two one one and and two two zero and so on the interesting thing is this if you think of four dots and two partitions as generic objects what we really want is all possible combinations of these six things but we don't care about the order of the dots or the order of the partitions or for that matter even the relative order of the two we just want to know how many ways are there to take six things and put four of them uh, in different places so that's a standard problem in combinatorics and the, here's the, here's the way you think about it if I had six distinct things like A B C D E F there are six factorial ways to order A B C D E F because I could uh, I could put the first thing down in six places and then if I've got six empty spots and I can lay the letters A B C D E F down in any order I could there's six ways to do the first letter there's five ways to do the second letter four ways to do the third letter and so on and so altogether if I care about the order of the letters I would have six factorial ways of doing it but if I group them in a group of four and a group of two and I don't care about the order of the group of four or the group of two then I have to divide by the number of ways to lay out four things and then also divide by the number of ways to lay out two things so I'd have to divide by two factorial times four factorial so this expression six factorial divided by four factorial times two factorial is a standard number in combinatorics it happens to be called the binomial coefficient which because it also shows up when you take a binomial to a power um, you end up with the same number basically and it also shows up in Pascal's triangle so uh, I can show you in class if you're interested how this relates to Pascal's triangle but the short story is it also tells us how many ways to order four quanta in three oscillators notice that if I have six factorial upstairs and four factorial downstairs that four times three times two times one all cancels because it's in the numerator and the denominator and six divided by two of course is three so the answer turns out to be three times five so omega is fifteen now that's the answer we got before but you can see now how you could get the answer in general if I have um, let's say twelve quanta in seven oscillators I could take 12 plus 7 minus 1 that would be the number of of spaces factorial divided by uh, 12 factorial times 7 minus 1 factorial so uh, I could compute in principle for any number of quanta with any number of oscillators I can calculate the number of ways in general so the formula that we're going to be using is this one q plus n minus 1 factorial over q factorial times n minus 1 factorial where n is the number of oscillators and q is the number of quanta okay so let's look at another demo to see how that turns out okay so here's a simple program you guys will be working with this in the lab but the idea is you've got 50 oscillators and you put 30 of them in one object and the remainder in another object n1 and n2 take a total of 30 quanta and then compute the number of ways of having that many quanta in object 1 and object 2 so you start with a quanta in object 1 at 0 the quanta in object 2 of course would be 30 and then you calculate the number of combinations for object 1 the number of combinations for object 2 the product will give you the total combinations for both objects and then you plot that as a histogram if we run this program <coughs> you'll see what we get is uh, something sensible so it looks like there 
there's a peak in the total number of combinations at around 18, which if you think about it, that's about 60% of 30. So 60% of 30 corresponds to 60% of the energy in the object with 30 oscillators and 40% uh, of the energy in the object with 20 oscillators. So anyway, that's the idea of that one. Okay, now let's talk about entropy. So entropy is defined in terms of the number of microstates that are available in a certain macrostate. The thing is, in order to be consistent with the historical definition of entropy, it, it turns out we need to take the natural log of the number of microstates. As you saw, the number of microstates grows very quickly because it's got, it's got factorials in it. Factorials grow very quickly. And uh, taking the log has a couple of advantages. One is it makes the numbers much more reasonable to deal with. And uh, the other thing is it, it, it works more naturally if you've got multiple systems that get combined into a bigger system. The entropy turns out to uh, be easier to think about for reasons that we'll get to here in a minute. So the definition we're going to use for entropy is the Boltzmann constant k. Sometimes that's k sub b. If there's a k in the problem, like a spring constant, it's useful to use k sub b as the Boltzmann constant, and then k can be the spring constant. Um, and it's times the natural log of the number of microstates. So uh, the Boltzmann constant is 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin. Okay, so here's a similar one, except that this time we're graphing the logarithm of the number of ways. And that's going to be proportional to the entropy. So entropy is the logarithm of the number of ways, the same combination calculation we're doing this time. And remember that the logarithm of the product is the sum of the logarithms. So as you can tell when you see the graph, there it is. The, uh, this is the uh, number of ways for Q1 to be distributed among n1, and as q1 gets big, the number of ways go up and the logarithm goes up. Here the logarithm drops as the number of ways of putting q2 in object 2 goes down. The sum of q1 and q2, remember, is 100. And uh, it turns out the product of the two is has a logarithm that's equal to the sum of the logarithms of the individual number of ways. And so this is what we call the entropy. And notice the entropy has a maximum uh, right around in here, which is also about 60, what is it? Around 67% or 60%, I guess 60%, yeah, 60% of the uh, of the total. When 60% of the oscillators are in the object that has 60% of the, uh, I'm sorry, 60% of the quanta are in the object that has 60% of the oscillators and 40% of the quanta are in the object that has 40% of the oscillators. That's the condition for a maximum number of ways or maximum entropy. So that's the idea. So let's look at this. If I have, uh, <clears throat> so on the left I have a picture that shows uh, two blocks of matter, one of which contains 300 oscillators, the other of which contains 200 oscillators. And let's assume that between the two of them they have a total number of quanta of uh, 100. So we have 100 quanta distributed between uh, two blocks of material, one of which has 300 oscillators and one of which has 200 oscillators. And the question is, what is the most likely distribution of energy? And the answer is that it's the distribution where the number of ways of having the energies distributed in that way is a maximum. So notice that as you increase the number of quanta in block one, the number of ways that you can put that many quanta in block one goes up, but you do that at the expense of the number of quanta in block two. If the number of quanta in block two goes up, its number of ways also goes up. What is the most likely? The most likely is the situation where the number of ways is maximized. We're going to find out that that's also the same thing as maximum entropy. So if you start the thing out with um, 90 oscillators in the orange block and 10 oscillators in the blue block and you wait around a while, it naturally reaches equilibrium. It, it reaches the uh, state where they have the maximum number of ways and that turns out to be when 
the uh, 300 oscillator block has 60, that would be block 1, and the 200 oscillator block, block 2, has only 40. That's kind of the idea. So, and what is the condition for equilibrium? Well, you, you could say it's the point where the maximum entropy occurs, the, the maximum number of ways occurs, and that's correct. But if you look at the graphs for entropy versus Q for the two blocks, notice that um, if you're to the right of equilibrium, the slope of the uh, sort of purplish line, the line for Q2, is greater in magnitude than the slope of the orangish line, the slope for, um, for block 1. If you look at the graph on the right here, for example, the blue slope is greater than the orange slope in magnitude, which means if you move to the left, the entropy goes up more for block 2 than it goes down for block 1. So that would produce a net increase in entropy. If you continue going to the left, you reach a point where the slope of the orange is greater than the slope of the blue, and in that case you'd be going down more than you're going up. The, you'd be losing more entropy in the orange than you'd be gaining in the blue, and so uh, the, the total entropy would fall. And the condition for having a maximum in the entropy is when the slopes of those two lines are equal. If the slope of the blue is the negative of the slope of the orange, it turns out the slope of the sum is the sum of the slopes. That points out another nice thing about taking the natural log. If you've got the number of ways of having two systems have a certain partition of energy, is the number of ways for system one times the number of ways for system two. But when you take the natural log, the entropy of the total system is the sum of the entropy of the first and the second. And that's because the log of a product is the sum of the logs. And so the sum of these two entropies is what matters, and it turns out that the condition for equilibrium is that the slope of the entropy versus Q graph is the same. But of course Q is another word for energy, because the number of quanta in a particular block is proportional to the energy in the particular block. So you end up with the definition of temperature <coughs> that's one over the slope. If you think about that, it means that the greater the slope, the lower the temperature, the lower the slope, the higher the temperature. And that also makes sense with regard to these graphs, because notice that as Q goes up, the slope become, becomes diminished. So the lower the slope, the more energy in the system, and the higher the temperature. So that's the idea. Let's also talk about specific heat capacity. If we, uh, if we have a block of material and we heat it up, its temperature is going to rise. The specific heat capacity, of course, is the uh, heat capacity per atom. In this case, we're talking about the atomic specific heat capacity, not the mass specific heat capacity. So it's the uh, change in the energy per atom per degree Kelvin. And um, that means as we increase the energy in the system, we're also going to increase the temperature. So and the way this works is you find you find the energy at one value of Q in the system, then you go to the neighboring values of Q, and you compute the change in the entropy per Q, and then you calculate the change in the energy per Q, get the temperature, and then calculate the heat capacity using the definition of heat capacity. So I've got a couple of spreadsheets that I think will help you um, see how that works. Hey guys, so I've got a little problem here. Uh, particle A is four atoms with one quantum of energy. Particle B is two atoms with two quanta of energy. And the notion is that they share the energy back and forth, and we want to figure out where equilibrium lies. Now, because particle A has four atoms, notice that each atom has three degrees of freedom, so that's 12 oscillators. Particle B has two atoms, that's three degrees of freedom per atom, so that's six oscillators. Okay, And we know that uh, particle A starts with 1 and particle B starts with 2, so that means we have a total of 3 quanta of energy. So I'm going to start Q, the total number of quanta in the system, at 3. So we're going to begin our table with particle A with 0 quanta. And particle B is going to have 3 minus 0. But I wrote 3 minus 0 in kind of a strange way. Let's look at it. It's B1 minus A6. That means 
take whatever's in this cell and subtract whatever's in this cell. Now, normally, if you just say B1, and we're currently in B6, that means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's the cell 5 rows up from the current cell. And A6, similarly, is the cell 1 row to the left of the current cell. Now, I want to keep the 1 row to the left thing, because when I drag this formula down, I want to get the number of quanta in particle A each time. But the 3, I don't want to move where that's coming from. So I'm going to come up here to this and tell it it's absolute. I put dollars in front of the B and dollars in front of the 1. That makes it an absolute reference. Okay. Now, what about this row? I want this to be 1, but I'm going to write it in a funny way. I'm going to write it as equals whatever's in the cell above me plus 1. Notice that, that the cell above me has a 1 in it, or a 0 in it, so 0 plus 1 is 1. But now if I drag this down, it automatically fills in with the cell above plus 1, the cell above plus 1. So I get 0 through 3. And notice if I drag this formula down now, because of the way it's written, I get 3, 2, 1, 0. So this is the number of quanta in particle B, given that A has 0. This is the number of quanta, quanta in particle B, given A has 1, and so on. Notice the sum always adds up to 3, as you'd expect. Now, uh, let's Actually, let's do the following thing. I want to calculate the natural log of the number of combinations for particle A, but let's do it in two steps. First, I'll use the combinatorial function to calculate the number of combinations of uh, ways of getting zero quanta in 12 oscillators. But notice how we do that. We take the number of quanta plus the number of oscillators Sorry, let's write it this way. Plus the number of oscillators, minus 1. That's the total number in my set of objects. And I want to take them out Q sub A at a time. So that's A6. So my formula is going to be, let's go look at it, uh, A6 plus B2. So that's Q plus N minus 1. Take Q. Now, the problem is, of course, B2 here, the number in particle A, that needs to be absolute because I always want it to go back and get the 12. So I'll put that in with dollar signs, and you can see that we get the number of combinations of three oscillators, or three quanta in 12 oscillators, 364. That's a lot easier than calculating it by hand. But actually what I want here isn't that, so this is the number of combinations, but what I really want is the natural log of the number of combinations. So I'm going to come back up here and make this ln combinations. And then that's going to turn the 1 into a 0, and it's going to turn these other numbers into the log of the corresponding number of combinations. So that's how that works. Now I could copy this over to here. And I'd get B6. Actually, that's what I want for particle B, except I don't want dollar $B, dollar $2. I want dollars $B, dollar $3. So let me edit this. Actually, I can just bring it down like that. Dollars $B, dollars $3. And now I've got the natural log of the number of combinations for particle 3. And notice it goes from 4 to 0. This goes from 0 to almost 6. And how do I get the natural log of the product of omega A and omega B? Well, it's obviously just the sum of the natural log. So here I'm just going to put this plus this, and then I'll drag that down. Whoopsie. Seem to be getting, uh, there we go. <coughs> so now you can see this is the log of the product, and this is proportional to the entropy. So you can see that the maximum happens at when QA is 2 and QB is 1. In other words, the situation in which the number of quanta is the, in the same proportion as the number of oscillators, 2 to 1. So that's not totally surprising, and that's kind of the way it works. Okay, guys, here's a similar example. We got a one-dimensional row of objects. There's five of them. Each has a certain mass. Um, each has a certain spring stiffness, and we're going to compute the uh, entropy as the number of quanta goes from zero up. So like we did before, we'll start the number of quanta at zero. We'll add one each time, like so, and I'll bump those up, 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 up. And then we'll calculate the number of ways of putting Q quanta into N oscillators. That's going to be combine 
of uh, q plus n minus 1 and then comma q again and remember that the n needs to be absolute so we'll put that in and we'll calculate that all right now we need the entropy so the entropy is the Boltzmann constant which I've already stuck in here times the natural log of the number of microstates so we're gonna set that equal to the Boltzmann constant which of course needs to be absolute multiply by the natural log of the number of microstates and that gives us the entropy obviously when there's only one way to do it there's no entropy five ways and so on now what about the energy so up here I've put the uh, the en change in energy is h bar times the square root of k over m k is uh, 15 newtons per meter times 4 so the point is in the Einstein model we break each spring in half and hold it still P imagine putting each atom in a box where the walls of the box are fixed and so that means we break the spring in half that doubles its spring constant and also there's one on this side and one on that side so that gives us four times the spring constant so we get four times the spring constant divided by the mass and that gives us a energy per uh, quantum of excitation okay so the energy in the qth state is going to be simply q times de but of course de needs to be absolute because it's in a table up there at the top so we can go down and now we have the energy for every state so we've got the entropy and we've got the energy let's go down and see what the next question is we want to know the temperature of the system when the total energy is for quanta so to get the temperature we need to take the change in energy divided by the change in entropy so the idea here is we take the energy of the next higher Q minus the energy of the next lower Q divided by the entropy of the next higher Q divided by the entropy of the next lower Q and that gives us a temperature so when we have one quanta of energy the temperature is 2716 Kelvin we'll go ahead and it's easy with the spreadsheet we can just go all the way up oh we can't do the last one because we it doesn't have a next higher energy but we can get all the way up to q equals six and the question is what's the temperature when q equals four so the answer is it's 460 kelvin now how do we get the heat capacity well to get the heat capacity we need to take the change in energy divided by the change in temperature so we'll do that here I only have temperatures defined starting at q equals one so I can only get the heat capacity starting at q equals two so it's temperature at three minus temperature at one divided by temperature at th uh, energy at three minus energy oh I'm doing this backwards dag on it okay so it's the change in the energy divided by the change in the temperature so it's the energy at three minus the energy at one divided by the temperature at 3 minus the temperature at 1 and that's the heat capacity for all five objects at Q equals 2 of course I can bump this up here we go bump this up and go all the way up to here um, I have to ref I have to stay within the bounds of my temperature so it looks like at Q equals 4 the heat capacity of the entire chain is 5 three or so times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin but the problem asks for the uh, the heat capacity per object so it wants to know the heat capacity per object at four quanta four quanta is here so the heat capacity per object is this number the heat capacity of the whole chain divided by the number of objects in the chain which in this case is five so we want to take the heat capacity of the whole chain divided by five and we can calculate that and you can see it's uh, it's a little bit less about 75 or 78 percent of the Boltzmann constant so the heat capacity per object is getting close to but it's not quite equal to the Boltzmann constant so that's how you get heat capacities using this kind of uh, calculation okay finally I want to show you a slide this is a uh, an example that shows you the heat capacity as a function of temperature for
an elemental solid. At low temperatures, the heat capacity goes to zero. And at high temperatures, the heat capacity reaches uh, an asymptotic value of around three times the Boltzmann constant. That's the heat capacity per atom in the material. And that turns out to be a universal behavior of practically all elemental solids. So what that means is we know that all elemental solids basically have the same high temperature heat capacity. And high temperature depends upon the frequency of natural frequency of vibration of the atoms in the solid. And uh, for most practical purposes, most elemental solids at room temperature are in the asymptotic domain. So that means we can just assume 3 kb per atom and calculate the heat capacity of a solid directly. So um, that's the main result of that thing. Oh, let's talk about the Boltzmann distribution. What the, the idea here is that uh, <coughs> we've got a large reservoir connected to a small system. And the question is, uh, what's the probability of having different amounts of energy in the small system? The key is to find the number of ways to have an energy total of E total while the small system has an energy of E. It turns out the more energy you give the small system, the greater its entropy is going to be, but at the cost of taking entropy away from the big system. And the most likely case um, is where the entropy, of course, is maximized. So let's take a look at that. The, uh, the probability of having any particular amount of energy is the product of the number of microstates in the reservoir times the number of microstates in the small system divided by the total number of microstates uh, regardless of E. So let's take a look at that. So we start out by taking the log of the expression from the last page and then uh, notice that the K times the natural log of omega of the reservoir is just the entropy of the reservoir. We need to add to that the entropy of the little system and to calculate the probability, we, we're going to, since we divided by the log of omega total, we're going to subtract k times the log of omega, omega total here. Now, focusing on the entropy of the reservoir, if you look at the diagram there to the left, notice that uh, the reservoir is very, very large, which means that if we take a little bit of energy out of the reservoir, it's not going to change its temperature very much. And the impact of that is that the slope of the entropy versus energy for the reservoir is almost constant for all reasonable values of E, the energy in the small system. So we can calculate the entropy of the reservoir at some particular value of E by subtracting the slope of the entropy versus the energy times the amount of energy we take out uh, and add that to the entropy the reservoir would have if it had all the energy. That's the idea. So, but wait a minute. ds dE is minus 1 over t. So what that means, I'm sorry, ds dE is 1 over t. So what that means is um, we can replace the derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy with 1 over the temperature and put that back in to the expression for the probability and then solve for the probability. And we get, uh, we get a nice expression that says it's the number of microstates of the small system that have a certain energy. That's sometimes called the degeneracy. And it's multiplied by this exponential factor, which is called the Boltzmann factor, which tells us that the probability of having more energy is less than the probability of having less energy. And we encountered this factor for the first time uh, way back, I think, in chapter 6, or maybe it was chapter 8. But anyway, we encountered this, pr this uh, probability a long time ago, and only now, when we got to entropy, could we figure out where it came from. Uh, don't worry too much about this derivation. It's a little bit subtle. It's a little bit sneaky. Um, but the result is very important, and you certainly should remember the result. So that's the idea. Now there are some examples, like for example, um, the pressure in the atmosphere goes down with altitude, and that's a consequence basically of this uh, factor. The rotational, vibrational, and translational energies that atoms and molecules can have, different energies have different probabilities, and part of that is this exponential factor. The, uh, at a given temperature, the probability of having a certain energy is given by this Boltzmann factor.
And that also works out molecular, the speeds of molecules in a gas it comes out to be the same exact factor and, uh, and so on. So there will be some homework problems that uh, permit you to sort of exercise how this works, but, uh, but that's the main idea. So that's all for this time. I hope you guys have a good uh, week with me gone in Denver, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again on Monday.